Welcome to this episode of Litigation Briefs, Media Shorts on Law and Courts. I'm Scott Dodson, a distinguished professor of law at UC Hastings College of the Law and the director of the Center for Litigation and Courts, which produces this series. Notice has intuitive appeal as a component of fairness, even in everyday situations. Parenting always seems to supply good examples. If I ask my teenager to come home for dinner instead of hanging out with her friends, and she does so only to find that dinner is meatloaf, she might complain that she would have chosen differently had she been told what was on the menu. Here, prior notice of the menu would have helped her make an informed choice, such as it is. If I scold my son for leaving the dishwasher unloaded, he might defend himself by saying no one told him it was ready. Here, prior notice of his chore would have helped justify my irritation. If I go to the store without telling anyone, my daughter has lost the opportunity to add something she wanted to my list. There, prior notice of my intention would have given her the opportunity to voice a need or a concern. Is civil litigation the same? And how does notice play out in court proceedings? Here to help me with these questions is my guest, Robin Efron, professor of law at Brooklyn Law School. Robin, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Is notice important in civil litigation? Yes, it's a very important value in terms of fairness and the law. So I will say, I think the parenting examples are great as are others from everyday life. It is sort of intuitively fair that before somebody makes a decision that they have notice of important factors that would go into that decision. So I will say as a parent of much younger kids, I found that my kids could articulate this uh, principle in their own way pretty much as soon as they could talk, right? The idea of you didn't warn me, why didn't you tell me that something was going to happen? That's something that even the smallest kids can feel as a principle of justice. So in fact, it is part of due process of law, which is guaranteed in the constitution and due process of law, of course, applies to civil litigation. So one way in which civil litigation is um, even a little bit more different from those everyday examples is that in everyday examples, things can change, people can change their mind, you can renegotiate things. In civil litigation, once a court issues a final judgment, that judgment is binding on the parties. And although it is possible to have a court undo certain things, it's pretty difficult to do and unusual. For the most part, a final judgment is binding on the parties and it's gonna follow them around for the rest of their existence until something is satisfied. And so before we have that sort of a thing hanging over people's heads, we really wanna make sure that they actually know that something is going to happen, that they know what is at stake, when it is gonna be adjudicated and where, and give them an opportunity to respond. So notice in civil litigation apprises litigants of their rights, it gives them choice and voice and legitimizes any final judgment, but give us some details. When in litigation do issues of notice come up? So for the most part in litigation, it comes up in litigation, sort of the ordinary type of lawsuit that you might think about when you're picturing a court. So a plaintiff is suing a defendant, everything from big corporations suing each other for millions of dollars, all the way down to much smaller disputes like landlord-tenant disputes or family law disputes or other smaller claims between parties. And this is a case where the plaintiff believes for whatever reason that the defendant owes them something. Typically the remedy that you're seeking might be money and compensation for some wrong, but it might also be something else or something else that the court can make them do. And so in these cases, the plaintiff knows about the lawsuit because the plaintiff is the one deciding to bring the lawsuit. But even if the defendant knows that they might have some sort of dispute in general with the plaintiff, they don't know that the plaintiff is actually gonna sue. So the purpose of notice is to give the defendant 
this warning, right? So the plaintiff has to serve the defendant with something called a summons and a complaint. So the summons is a piece of paper that has information on it that tells them that the lawsuit is happening. It's gonna tell them where they are being sued and when and other really important information like how to appear in the lawsuit and when they have to respond. The complaint is the document in which the plaintiff is explaining legally to the defendant what they think they are owed, right? The plaintiff says, I think you did something wrong. I think that this wrong thing is something for which the law has said there is a legal remedy. And here's the remedy that I'm asking for. Here's what I'm asking from, from you, right? Whether it's money, whether it is an injunction or something else that the court can order the defendant to do to the plaintiff. Now that's sort of regular litigation, but notice comes up in other parts of litigation as well. Once the ball is rolling, of course, there are lots of other documents and information that need to go back and forth between the parties. Most of the time this is worked out informally, right? that is allowed under most rules, but we still wanna make sure that everyone receives everything. And then also there are situations that are a little bit outside of litigation where notice is still important. So one of them is that there are a lot of times where the government is going to do something that affects the rights of people. It might be that they are altering social security benefits or taking a benefit away or making a decision about somebody's entitlement to something like, for example, whether or not in a state somebody can be bused to school. And those are examples where in certain situations we wanna make sure that people have noticed that some decision is gonna be made so that they can in some form or another participate. And then the final way in which we often see notice come up is that sometimes people are gonna ask for things in lawsuits that are called provisional remedies. So this is where you're asking the court to do something before the whole case has been adjudicated. So let's say you're a plaintiff and you're really worried that this particular defendant is gonna do something like take all of the assets and run away with them and hide them before you can get a remedy. Or perhaps the uh, lawsuit is about a piece of property and the plaintiff is worried that the defendant might burn it down out of spite. In those situations, the plaintiff has the ability to ask the court to take something away from the defendant provisionally or temporarily. And in those cases, even for those temporary remedies, we still in most cases are going to give the adverse party the chance to respond, right? Even before these temporary deprivations. And so that's another time where notice is important. We wanna make sure that the other party knows that something is about to happen and they have the opportunity to show up. Let's talk about the mechanics of notice. Does the person, the defendant or the property holder have to actually receive notice? So they don't, actually have to receive notice. Um, and there's a few reasons for this. So up until now, we've been talking about how important notice is for the defendant, or you know, we might call them the adverse party, because we don't want to decide things in their absence. But you could also think about things from the plaintiff's point of view. The plaintiff has the right to bring their dispute to the court and wants to get the ball rolling and be able to do so in a way that doesn't really drive up costs or make things unnecessarily difficult. And one thing that defendants could do or can do is evade service, right? They can make themselves really difficult to find. In other situations that aren't quite as nefarious, it might just be that defendants are, for example, corporations or businesses or people who aren't home a lot. And we don't want to make it so difficult for plaintiffs to actually serve the defendant that it becomes possible impossible for the lawsuit to ever get going. So what jurisdictions have done, right, what states and the federal courts have done is come up with sets of rules that say, you know, plaintiff, if you go through these steps, for example, if you show up at someone's house to serve them with the lawsuit, and the defendant isn't there, but someone who looks, you know, old enough and like a reasonably responsible person, if that person's there, you can leave the summons and complaint with them 
And we're gonna say that that's enough, right? You've done your job, you've dropped off the papers, you, and so whether or not the defendant actually reads them, this is now the defendant's problem. So there's lots of different rules that are all sort of tailored to different circumstances that sort of look at types of defendants, right? Whether it's businesses or people, we have special rules for vulnerable people, for example, minors or people who are not competent in other ways. We say, if they're served in this particular way, we're gonna call that okay. And we're not going to have lengthy and expensive investigations into the question of whether this person actually received notice of the lawsuit, we're going to say the plaintiff followed the rules, those rules are good enough. And in law, we call that constructive notice, that we're going to construct this fiction that whether or not you read it, you've actually gotten notice of the lawsuit. So actual notice is not necessarily required. It's constructive notice. What are some other forms of constructive notice or reasonable notice? So one of the ones that's the biggest one is use of materials that are not traditional. So most of the time we think of notice as being a piece of paper, right? Physical notice that is delivered from one party to another. But sometimes it's hard to know how to serve a party because it's actually difficult to know who those parties are. So an example that a lot of people are familiar with is the idea of a class action. So in a class action, all of the people who are members of a class in certain types of class action are entitled to notice, right? So before a court says that, you know, the defendant is responsible and liable for this behavior and all the class members have a remedy, you want to make sure that the class members have a chance to respond and say, maybe I don't want to be part of this class action, or maybe I think that this proposed remedy is unfair or unworthy. So we need to figure out how to serve the class members. Well, if you think about it, big class actions with thousands, if not millions of people, you're not going to have process servers out there handing notice to everyone showing up at their door. And these days, you're not even going to send them things in the mail. This is a situation where you can use email or even things like social media accounts or Twitter. So that's been sort of the forefront of using electronic methods. But even outside of class actions, some courts have found and some states explicitly say in their rules that if a plaintiff is having difficulty finding a defendant through traditional means, like it's really hard to find them where they live or there's no meaningful address where you could send something or serve something, that it is permissible to do things like serve them via DM on Twitter or Facebook or other social media sites. So those are unusual circumstances, but they have definitely happened. Um, those, go ahead. Go ahead. Those unusual circumstances raise the question of what happens if a reasonable notice form is used, but the party still doesn't actually receive notice of the proceeding. What happens? Well, the law does usually allow innocent parties who really through no fault of their own didn't receive actual notice. So these are rules in state court and federal court that allow a party to ask that court to vacate the judgment and essentially start all over again. So one of the interesting things about this is that many of these rules really entrust a lot of discretion to the trial judge. That means that some of these rules don't have kind of hard and fast situations in which this is possible, but they essentially say, hey, trial judge, we know that you see a lot of this. You've seen a lot of litigants, a lot of litigation, a lot of service, a lot of parties. If this seems like a situation where everyone was doing their best, but for various reasons, the defendant genuinely did not find out about something and was unable to defend themselves, then the judgment can be vacated and things kind of reset and uh, parties can start all over again if that's possible. So one example um, of a case that I love to talk about with my students is a case that involved Pepsi. So there were two guys in Wisconsin 
and they believed that they invented bottled water for whatever reason. Back in the 80s, they decided that bottled water was a great idea. If you can remember that far back, bottled water was not really a big thing back then. We did not walk around with little plastic bottles of water. Um, and so they claimed to have pitched this idea to Pepsi and some uh, other corporations. Fast forward to the early 2000s, and at this point, bottled water has become a huge business, including Pepsi, which is uh, their branded bottled water is Aquafina. So, the, so these two guys sue Pepsi and a few other defendants claiming that they are entitled to literally billions of dollars because of all sorts of intellectual property and breach of contract reasons. So what does this have to do with notice and service? Well, they uh, sued the defendants. They serve the summons and complaint on Pepsi at Pepsi's headquarters in North Carolina. And something goes wrong in North Carolina. It looks like some administrative assistant somehow lost the summons and complaint, did not forward it on to the central legal staff or whoever is actually handing, handling the lawsuits. So the hearing date comes, two guys show up in state court in Wisconsin, Pepsi's not there. And the judge says, so what are your damages? What are you owed? And they say something like $5 billion. So the judge says, okay, well, default judgment. They, you know, hit the gavel and Pepsi is suddenly hit with billions of dollars to these two guys. And all they've done is claim that they invented bottled water. So if the summons and complaint didn't catch Pepsi's attention, a $5 billion judgment definitely caught Pepsi's attention. So at this point, Pepsi goes to Wisconsin. And even though they are somewhat at fault for this, right? After all, Pepsi is in charge of their own employees. They are the ones who have set up this processing system. They basically say, look, judge, obviously we would have shown up if we didn't know. We genuinely didn't know. And the judge goes through some reasons and says, among other things, that the complaint did not specify exactly what the damages were. The complaint just said, we're seeking damages in excess of $75,000. And then, you know, since these depend, the plaintiffs show up in court, that's when they say $5 billion. The judge says, you know, Pepsi didn't mean to lose the complaint. And they didn't have notice that losing the complaint would be a $5 billion error, right? As opposed to say a $75,000 error. So that was a way in which a court used both kind of the mechanics of notice, but also the substance of notice. The idea that it's not just about getting that physical piece of paper, but it's what that piece of paper says, right? It tells people how seriously to take something. And there a judge says, look, we're not going to say that uh, you know, a partial breakdown in your system should be a $5 billion error. So the judge vacates the judgment, the lawsuit goes forward. The lawsuit doesn't really go anywhere, um, but that's a whole other story um, that uh, is about Pepsi and, and not so much about notice. That's a great story, Robin. Thanks so much for being with us today and explaining why notice is important to Pepsi and to all kinds of parties in civil litigation. Okay, thank you so much. This episode was produced by the Center for Litigation and Courts at UC Hastings College of the Law. If you enjoyed this episode of Litigation Briefs, I hope you'll tune in to future episodes. In fact, I hope you'll consider subscribing to our YouTube channel and audio podcast which can be accessed through the Center for Litigation and Courts website at sites.uchastings.edu slash CLC. While you're at it, encourage a friend to do the same. This is Litigation Briefs, respectfully submitted, Scott Dodson. <laughs>